semi and the uh, uh, production side, right? You, you, you're solving a known problem in a known market, right? But entrepreneurship is something different, right? It's about uh, bringing in something new, right? So that a factor of innovation is always there. And it all really starts at a, at a very, um, you really cannot put a finger as to where it starts, but you, you know the right kind of people, right? It starts with the right kind of people coming together and kind of forming the uh, founding team, if you will, right? Uh, so the founding team, what is important in that founding team is there, and you can go and ask most teams where, uh, uh, you know, there are more than uh, one people who are who are involved. Uh, the foundational part of the of the team is that there must be trust within the founding team, right? Uh, there must be trust within that founding team, and that trust comes either from a position of mutual respect or it comes from a, a position of uh, having known each other, uh, of, of there being a lot of familiarity with uh, uh, between the individuals, right? That's where the trust comes from. And uh, that is why you find that in most founding teams, you have people who went to college together, uh, you have people who worked on a project together, you have people who were co-workers, you'll have people who, uh, uh, you know, there is, a, you know, they've known each other from, from their neighborhood, but there is that foundational trust uh, within that team, right? And because there are numerous activities that the uh, team has to perform, uh, it is best that uh, you find a team that has kind of complementary skills, so that uh, you know each member can uh, take up uh, um, 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 or excel in a particular um, uh, role right at this point you must understand that in india we do allow proprietary companies we do allow uh, one person companies right uh, but the workload to uh, create an you know you know create an innovation the checks and balances that you have when you have a, a, a you know a, a team with complementary skills are uh, more mature right this complementary skills help as i said because there are a lot of activities that needs to be done right the founding members the founders have to wear many hats if you will right this involves right setting the mission and the vision of the organization of of what is the big problem that they're trying to solve, right? Who are they trying to solve it for, right? So that comes as part of the mission and vision, right? Then definitely you have to get about uh, executing some of that plan, you know, running the operations of the show, right? Uh, you have to kind of figure out what is it that you are selling? How are you going to go to market with that uh, particular strategy, right? These are all very preliminary thought processes, but the founders have to come together. They have to meet over whether it is coffee or uh, whatever uh, uh, common passions that they enjoy, right? And they have to keep on iterating uh, numerous times over, uh, you know, what is this organization that they are trying to give shape to, right? Uh, over time, they will grow, right? So they have to kind of set the organizational policies, right? The organizational culture, uh, the talent pool, right? Uh, they are the ones who are responsible for the bottom line, uh, for maintaining the bottom line, driving the valuation, the product strategy, right? The organizational uh, efficiency processes, right? So organizational digitization and efficiency processes, right? The brand development for the uh, for the product, and as well as they have to hear the voice of the customer, right? So there are quite a few roles that the founders would need to play and uh, they need to be aware of this uh, kind of a workload so that it can be managed right uh, this is just a fii that yes all these activities are there when you are starting a company uh, so uh, you know these are things that you kind of discuss about uh, even before the company has actually been uh, formed right but once you've gone past uh, this stage and uh, the founders are kind of, uh, they've kind of come together, right? Uh, you go about setting a vision for the organization, right? That you are, that you are, uh, are trying to create. And what is key about this vision statement is that uh, the vision statement sh should be broad and strategic, right? Because it should be broad and strategic because, uh, you can decide to open up uh, 
uh, you know, uh, mm, uh, a food stall selling a new kind of a food uh, in, in front of a mall, right? Uh, and that is, you know, uh, to a certain extent, that is entrepreneurship, right? But the focus is very, very narrow, right? But if you start thinking that you're going to build a franchise out of that, right? You're going to have a, a business model that can scale up, right? You will find that there are people uh, who would be interested in uh, the strategic growth plan of the organization, right? So normally when you are building an organization, you should have a broad vision and uh, uh, the vision should, you know, it should become uh, pretty, it should be very clear to the founding team, right? Because down the line, when you make decisions about your organization, decisions about the nature and uh, the soul of the organization, right? You really measure them against the vision statement that you uh, had uh, set out for yourself, right? And always remember that down the line when you're raising money for the, for the venture, right? Uh, your strategic investors are going to align on this vision, right? They may not agree with your uh, GTM plan, with your current GTM plan. They may not agree with your current execution strategy, right? But they will always align on the long-term vision, right? On the on the overall growth path that you have set out uh, for the company to achieve, right? So that is why uh, it's it's important to have clarity on that uh, vision statement. Right? Once you get past that stage, right, we move on to the next step of, you know, once you have a vision, now you kind of go to the market to identify what are the kind of gaps where your vision can uh, uh, can create a, a solution uh, that can be accepted by the market, right? And there are several strategies that are available to do a, a what we call is a market gap analysis, right? You could do primary research, right? And uh, with primary research, you are going and talking to the people, uh, talking to potential customers, talking to people who have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, who are your ideal customers and understanding if they really have a pain, right? If they have a pain point and uh, what you are proposing to build, uh, would they be willing to pay money for that, right? Would, would there be a value for that kind of a service to them, right? So that's why you do your market research, either by using primary market research means of, you know, collecting, uh, 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 conducting focus group studies, uh, talking to people, or you uh, can can uh, buy certain uh, market research uh, reports from uh, organizations like Gartner, uh, you know, who will uh, provide you an insight about the maturity of that market. Right. So you do not fly blind, right? Because uh, it's important to get some direction early on. The other thing you could do is uh, you could look at patents, right? At the patent landscape, you could look at who are the players who are filing for uh, patents in that particular area, uh, what kind of intellectual property uh, is being created, who are the parties creating those uh, creating those uh, patents, right? So that you have a sense of not only companies who are your who are your named competitors, but also companies which may be developing plans in as part of their R and D pipeline uh, to uh, in order to enter the market shortly. Right. Uh, third thing that you look for essentially is your competition positioning. Uh, you look at uh, what the com competition is doing, uh, what is the price point they are uh, offering their 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 services at. Uh, what is the kind of market share that they have captured, right? So that also gives you a sense of uh, whether there is a positioning play that you can make. You can offer the same service, right? For example, uh, when low-cost airlines came into the market, right? Uh, you know, the airlines are taking you from city A to city B, right? A full fare airline is also taking you there, right? But by unbundling the prices, uh, by positioning the, the base product at a lower price point, uh, it may become more appealing. It opened up a new market segment for uh, for them, right? So that's how you do a market gap analysis, right? Uh, the fourth thing that you look at is essentially feature demand, right? And uh, by feature demand, what I mean is uh, you, uh, you know, you your, your product, you may have thought of uh, 
uh, a number of different things that you want to include in your product, right? But some of these features would require uh, a lot of expenses to develop. Some of them are low hanging fruits, right? So uh, you need to talk to your customer base to figure out if adding that feature would actually make uh, uh, the product more appealing or not. Uh, Apple recently launched its, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the 13 uh, range of iPhones, and they are pitching the best camera ever, right? Uh, yes, it is a you know $1,200 phone, uh, but you know they must have done their market research to understand that their customer is willing to pay for uh, top dollars for top technology in their phones, right? So that's how you understand if your uh, if there is market demand for the features that you are trying to bring in, right? And that will come through customer persona insights, where you identify who is your ideal customer, where do you find them, and uh, uh, essentially just just talking to them, right? Uh, no entrepreneur has been able to establish a company without understanding their market really well, without understanding their customer really really well, right? Also, by knowing, you know, by, by, by looking into your customer persona, you also get a sense of where these people are, uh, where are they kind of concentrated, right? Uh, what is the addressable population that you have uh, with the features that you are proposing to build, right? Uh, and that kind of gives you a roadmap in terms of what are the things that you want to build first, what are the things that uh, can be further down in your in your roadmap, which is the target uh, geography where you want to use as your as your test market, right? Uh, where would you find the the uh, highest concentration of your uh, ideal customers, right? And it gives you insights about how to reach out to them as well, right? So once you have set your uh, once you have set your vision, right, you need to get into the uh, market to understand what is going on, because without that, you will not be able to move forward and set some tangible goals for yourself. Right? I'll come to that in a moment. right? But as part of your market gap analysis, what comes out is your uh, SWOT analysis. Right. Uh, as an organization, you know, given that you have the founding team and, uh, uh, you know, the, the combined set of resources that the founding team has. And resources could be anything. It could be uh, your, your location where you are operating out of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, your, your technology backgrounds, right? Uh, your experience in a particular technology or in a particular domain, right? All of this could become your strengths, right? The, then also the competitive analysis, the patent analysis, it kind of tells you your weaknesses as well. What is the competition doing? Uh, where can they overrun a, a product like yours, right? Uh, can they overcome the entry barrier that you are setting up with your, uh, with your vision, right? And at the same time, the opportunities and the threats, which essentially are you know, uh, things that are outside your control, uh, but uh, environmental policy issues that uh, may have a bearing on your uh, on your uh, uh, business outcomes. Right? So you're aware of this that uh, you know uh, with the with the pandemic, right? Uh, there were certain companies that uh, that uh, did extremely well. They they found opportunities in the pandemic. Whereas other companies uh, like in the uh, hospitality sector, in the uh, uh, transport sector, right, they, they came under heavy losses, right? So the same uh, external condition can create new opportunities and threats, right? You just need to be kind of aware of what are the vulnerabilities of your business uh, so that you can take proper precautions, right? It's an iterative process. So when you uh, kind of do your market gap analysis, you will come across, you know, the kind of features that are uh, in demand, right? That uh, the that your customer base wants to buy, and that will give you the product ideas, like which features are to be bundled into your particular product. Uh, and then again, you take those to the market, right? And understand if 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 the market is is appreciating them. And you kind of iterate over this whole thing until you have come to a point where your product idea has has solidified quite a bit, right? Whether it is in terms of the features of the product that you are offering 
or it is uh, the uh, you know the market segment uh, or the positioning innovation that you are bringing in or you are changing the process by which the 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 things were done before, right? And a typical example is your e-commerce process, right? Uh, earlier, we went to a supermarket, uh, uh, picked out the kind of things that we needed, right? And we went to the billing counter, got it uh, checked out, right? With e-commerce, you can sit at home, uh, pick out the things from a virtual and add things to a virtual cart, check out, and the products are delivered to your home, right? So it's the shopping process that has undergone uh, change with, uh, with e-commerce, right? Or it could be a paradigm change, right? So when you when you kind of build your product, when you build the innovation in your in your uh, uh, business, right? The innovation space uh, is multi-dimensional, right? It could be a little bit of process, a little bit of the product, on, and more of positioning, or any combination of all of them, right? Uh, you have to understand that that innovation does not always mean a technology innovation. Innovation means a uh, an entry barrier for your competitors, right? That is uh, going to help you hold on to your market, right? With this idea, with the product idea now being set, right? With your vision now being set, with the product idea now being set, you can move forward to define your mission statement. What will you achieve? in the next six months? What will you achieve in the next one year? What will you achieve in the next five years? What will you achieve in the next 10 years, right? So you create a, 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 a long-term goal, a mid-term goal, and a short-term goal, and try to align all of them, right? So that you are going towards your mission. Right? Mission statements are usually very, very tangible, right? They are, uh, they are uh, you know, while as the vision statement is broad and strategic, right? The mission statement is usually something that is achievable, right? And the second most important characteristic of mission statements are that mission statements must be time bound. Right? So what do you want to achieve within a particular time frame? That is what your mission statement is, right? Having said that, you are now ready to actually form your company, right? So these are kind of thought processes that, that keep on happening all around you as you uh, develop your your ideas, right? And uh, once you have laid out a vision and a mission statement, you are now ready to form a company. Uh, any any questions so far? Right. So I'll I'll push on a little bit, right? Forming that company itself uh, is, uh, you know, there is a lot of paperwork uh, involved before you are registered as a company or as a business, right? And uh, uh, that process starts off with essentially you having the right to have a name, right? Which means that uh, you need to kind of look up your company name with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, see that it is it is a it is a valid name that uh, that can be taken up. Certain names like government. Uh, you know, Indian Institute, certain names are reserved and cannot be used as, as part of your uh, company's name, nor uh, can you have a company's name that is uh, 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 very similar to an established business, right? Uh, so those are things that the MCA will look for uh, when you uh, try to register your company's name. The next thing is uh, you kind of have to define your business, your class of business service, and the MCA provides a categorization of business services, right? Uh, whether it is educational services or it is business services or it is uh, manufacturing, right? Uh, you have to identify a business service uh, for your company, a class of business service, right? Uh, along with that, uh, as a company forms, you need an article of association, you need a memorandum of, uh, um, uh, of, of association, so, so that what you call is an MOA or an AOA, right? that defines how the partners or the founders are coming together and how the operations of the, uh, of the company are going to be conducted. Right? And accordingly, you can go ahead and register the company with uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and you will get a company uh, identification number or a SIN number for that. Right? A part of that process, if you are, if you are not already associated with as a director in some other company, uh, is that you need to get your digital certificates uh, and uh, apply for a 
director registration number right uh, so that all the directors of the of the company have to be registered with the uh, with the mca right having done that you now need to say that you know where are you going to run your business right what is the what is the proof of uh, you know the, the the location for that business what is going to be the business address right and based on that you need to get a trade license from your local uh, municipality or uh, your your local uh, governing authority and the trade license kind of takes into account that you have all the necessary clearances right if you're opening up a restaurant then you have a, a fire safety uh, um, license right if you are opening up a manufacturing plant then you uh, or a food production plant you have a um, fssi license right so the trade license will take into account whatever uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, licenses you uh, you know clearances you need before you can set up a business in that class of service right uh, your company will also start up with either a, you know when you register you will get a, a, a taxation number a tan number and a pan number and uh, if you are planning to uh, have significant uh, uh, sales you can also apply for a, a gst registration upfront right uh, or you can wait until until your revenue uh, goes up to a certain point right uh, if you're registered under startup india uh, then you get certain benefits, uh, certain uh, uh, benefits with respect to your uh, taxation for the first few years, right? Uh, this information is critical to kind of open up your current account with a bank, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, um, get a, uh, uh, the ability to kind of transact uh, in the name of the company from that account. This is when you're still at a founding stage, but once you grow a little bit and you start getting more and more employees into the organization, right? You have to have compliances with the uh, uh, with the uh, you know labor laws of the land, right? And part of that that comes with the Employee Provident Fund organization or the ESI, right? Uh, so these are welfare associations that the that, that the local governments have kind of set up and uh, ensure that your uh, labor or your workforce is not uh, uh, exploited, right? Uh, you may choose to now go ahead and uh, either trademark your company's name or if you are operating under a particular brand, uh, register those uh, 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 trademarks with the IP cell or file for any other IP that you want, any other copyright or anything that you want. Now bear in mind that uh, trademark registration will take about six to eight months, right? Uh, and, and you have to kind of give it uh, that kind of time, right? Uh, after examination of the of the mark that you want, uh, it will be put up for, for, for the public to kind of comment on and raise objections, right? And then you eventually it will get granted, right? Uh, if you are uh, putting up a web presence and today pretty much every organization will have some kind of a web presence, right? Uh, you need to get your domain registration done, which is also your IP, right? Uh, ensure that you have uh, visitors coming to your uh, to your domain and uh, to your website, right? And then you are pretty much ready to start your business from a uh, from a legal perspective, right? All right. So now that you have formed your company, you are developing your your product, and uh, pretty much at this point, you are out of money, right? Uh, so um, unless you are starting with a significant capital. At this stage, you must go out to the world and uh, start asking for money, right? Uh, that's where the pitch deck comes in, uh, where you are in the early stages of your uh, of your startup and you are looking to raise funds for your for your organization, right? And uh, that's where you are starting to look at, uh, you know, essentially how do you uh, uh, pitch your company to 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 others. For Remember what I mentioned about investors aligning on uh, strategic interests, right? So that is why the first thing in a pitch deck is your vision and mission statement. What is it that your company is about? Not, not what is it today, but what do you envision the company to be and how do you see the growth path, right? So that's your vision and mission. What is the problem that you're solving, right? And this comes out of your discussions with your customer person or your market research by getting data from your cust of, of potential customers saying that you know uh, or proving that they need the features that you are developing in your product right and uh, why do they need those features right so that's your problem statement 
And uh, uh, depending on your customer profiles or your customer personas, uh, you also get a sense of your serviceable market, right? Where do you going to uh, market your product along with the innovations that's going to prevent a competition from coming and entering your uh, market segment with a competitive uh, product, right? So what are the innovations that you are bringing in, right? Uh, if you're going to an investor, uh, you are uh, asking them for money and uh, they will lend you that money if they see a motivation for it, right? So they need to understand what is your growth projection, right? If you already have, a, uh, you know, when you're making this pitch deck, you probably don't have anything. You don't have real customers yet, right? But uh, the serviceable market and what is the growth path that you are laying for yourself, right? Uh, as an organization, that gives a lot of confidence to potential investors, right? Uh, and finally, you're asking them for money, right? So you have to tell them that, yes, I have a lot of pr product innovations, but I cannot build all of that on day one, right? So what we will do is we will build a minimum viable product, right? Which a few of the more important product uh, uh, features, right? And how much money do we need uh, for building that MVP? When will that MVP be finished and we can go and take it to market? We can test it out in the market itself, right? So those are essentially the main components on the, the more technical components of the of a pitch deck. The final component, always very, very important is who are you, right? Who is your team, right? That's where the founding team's credibility comes into question, right? Uh, how can, uh, how can the, the investors trust your uh, competency, right? Whether it is experience, whether it is uh, the innovation part of it, right? So investments are always made on based on the team competency, right? The other things may change down the line, right? But the team is not going to change. The founding team is not going to change, right? And uh, you see that, you know, even with companies that have you know, uh, raised money, uh, Airbnb is a classic example, very simple pitch deck that they have, right? Describing what they are, right? What's their catch line? Uh, book rooms with locals rather than hotels, right? That's their pitch. It kind of explains what they do in a very simple phrase, right? That's very, very important. Now they have the problem statement that pricing is a concern and, uh, uh, you know, uh, can customers get a homely feel at a lower price point, right? What is their solution? They have a web platform that will that will map the, the customers with uh, people who are willing to host them, right? That's their solution. And they're getting a market validation because there are uh, similarish, uh, this is called an adjacent market validation, but they have similarish companies which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, which indicate that there is a market, right? Uh, and they are deriving this market uh, market size based on the number of travelers that are going, right? And they're describing the kind of product features over here, right? Very simple, very clean slides. Uh, what's their business model? They're going to take a percentage of the of the revenue. Uh, how are they going to publicize their product, right? Who are the competition that is coming in? What are their advantages? And what is their team, right? That is very, very important, right? What kind of previous background has the team had in terms of running these uh, 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 kind of solutions, right? Uh, what kind of public uh, PR they are getting? So that's 12 and two more slides, user testimonials and financials. That's about it, 14 slides, and they were able to raise close to 70, uh, 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 close to uh, almost a million dollars at a $70 million valuation, right? Today, they are almost a 30, you know, they're valued at uh, close to, I think, 60, 65 billion, right? Uh, but that's how the valuation grows, right? Investors invest because they see, uh, they can they can associate with that problem very well, the problem that you are pitching, right? It does not have to be the, the uh, you know, it, it does not have to be a product that's going to make you millions all the time, right? Make you billions all the time, but it has to be a product that needs to have a vision about where it is going. The clarity of the vision uh, will affect the the, the, the the seed money that you, that you get, right? And that money goes in towards building some of the MVPs, towards expanding the business, right? So, uh, uh that's on, on on airbnb side right so once you are pitching right once you form the company and you've started your your pitching you know you will you will hit some you will miss some and uh, there will be a few people who will come up and and support you right that's the nature of the world uh no two investors will look uh you know look at the same things but 
there will be people who will be who will find your idea extremely attractive right and once you have raised that fund you really go to market to kind of create your minimum viable product right uh, what the product is you you know your feature list right you know which features to kind of prioritize and you know the cost that is associated with building each of those features right uh, you need your efficacy measures how are you going to measure that your product is uh, uh, is is relevant to the market right so you kind of have to have those those metrics in place saying that if this marker moves up i know that the market likes my product right uh, if you need to have certain certifications in order to for you to sell that product right uh, go get them done because it creates a lot of credibility around it right and in as part of that mvp if you can identify the ip uh, that you are building right it uh, you may not be able to protect it immediately because your your mvp will go through a lot of iterations but identifying that that uh, identifying that ip kind of uh, helps you uh, know what to protect and uh, the, you can you can always go and uh, raise money to to to, to protect that um, ip and having your own ip always affects the valuation of the organization right uh, because you are taking a, a a selected feature list from everything that you have in mind it also kind of gives you your product roadmap right the product roadmap it is exactly what it says it's a roadmap it's not a fixed development plan right uh, it means things that you want to do down the line and based on how your market is reacting uh, you may have to switch things around in your roadmap some things that you thought you would do two years three years down the line you may have to bring it up uh, significantly based on how your market responds right so once you build the MVP, the next stage is to try out this MVP in a test market, right? Identify an isolated market where uh, uh, you, you can run the tests and every time you uh, run the test, get your evaluation metrics, come back to the MVP, right? Iterate on this as many times as you need to, right? Until you get your unit economics, right? Until you know that the product that you are trying to sell has found the right kind of audience uh, who will uh, appreciate and pay for that particular product, right? That's the purpose of this step to kind of test and test and test uh, on this uh, market again and again. What you are looking for is, uh, you know, essentially uh, not only the geographical location of the test market, but uh, how is the innovation that you are bringing in, right? How is that innovation diffusing within society? Uh, who are the people who are absorbing that product early, right? Uh, what is their demography, right? Uh, can you do an A-B testing? Uh, can you give a placebo to, to, a, to, a, to a different group and see if the, if the product that you're offering is actually making a difference that it is claiming to make, right? And you keep on iterating over your MVP, right? Because in case it may so happen that a feature that you introduce is the market does not like that feature right so uh, uh, so you know you, you 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 generally pick a test market such that uh, it can it can be contained right if things go south uh, you can rebrand and, and reintroduce the product in a different test market right uh, and you can you can change things around a little bit right that is why it is important to have a test market rather than spoiling your entire addressable market uh, with a bad feature okay. uh, this happens all the time like uh, yesterday i was watching a video about uh, elizabethan uh, uh, or Edwardian homes uh, in the in the early uh, 20th century, where uh, when electricity had just been uh, invented and a lot of electrical products were coming into the market, so uh, there was companies which were introducing these uh, electrical table mats, uh, and you could plug in a, a bulb directly onto the table. The challenge was that uh, insulation wires had not yet been introduced, and that was a, a, a massive, massive failure right uh, that product did not pick up but the company could move away from that and build something else right they, they had an idea they tried out in the market it did not work they moved on right? that's important right? when i talk about the innovation diffusion uh I, I i want you to understand that you know no product is going to be liked by its entire audience from day one right there are always going to be some innovators who will try your product then there are the early adopters and then you find that there is this 
chasm, right, which you have to cross to gain uh, mass acceptance. So this is really the critical mass. If you find about 15% of your audience, uh, of your target market accepting your product, you know that you are at the place where you can move into the majority market and you can change your marketing pitch, your marketing strategy, so that you now address the larger sections of the, of the group, right? Uh, this is where you can bring in a lot of niche advertising, but as you target the early majorities and the late majorities, you are moving into a, uh, 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 you're, you're moving into a mass advertising uh, regime, if you will. So it's important to track how your product is, is diffusing into the market, into your test market. And that tells you a lot about uh, your uh, product's acceptance, right? Uh, if, if, if only 1% is accepting, 2% is accepting, right? You have not reached a large enough audience in order to, to know that uh, the, 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 the product is good or not, right? Uh, you need to keep on trying to do that. But once you are in this place, right, where there are a large number of people who are adopting, uh, 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 who have started adopting your, your product, right, clearly you have achieved unit economics, right? You, you, you are making uh, more money per unit product sold than you are spending on making it, right? Then you can start thinking about your expansion plans, right? And your expansion plans could come in from multiple areas. It could be a, an expansion of your uh, product portfolio, right? Uh, it could be an expansion of the services that you're offering around your, your product, right? It could be an expansion of your customer delight plan, uh, kind of setting up a, 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 a follow-up channel to uh, you know, provide customer feedback, provide additional uh, after sales supports, or it could be a brand expansion plan, right? You could move from uh, advertising in regional uh, 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 regional papers to, to, to national TV, right? Or you could be expanding the territories where your services are being offered, right? Uh, or you could open up products which are in a different positioning, right? Your team would need to expand, your board would need to expand, right? Your office would need to expand, right? So you are getting into that space where you are now expanding, right? And that leads us to the growth stage, right? This is the cycle again, because once you're in the growth stage, you again, like just like you made your pitch deck, you again go back, raise money, raise investments in terms of series funding, series A, B, C, D, E, right? And every time you're raising money, you are asking for, uh, you know, essentially you are pitching for further expansion, right? Uh, along any one of those lines uh, that I mentioned earlier, right? So slightly different things in your pitch deck than uh, uh, for your for your MVP, for your early stage uh, pitch deck to your series level pitch deck, because by this time you now have assets, right? You now have intellectual property, you now have a customer base, uh, you now have a product portfolio, right? You have inventory, right? So there is valuation of your asset, right? Uh, so uh, at this point, you now go and ask for, uh, when you ask for investment, you, you go with a specific purpose, right? How much uh, are you asking for and what is going to be the projected return on investment, right? Whether it is going to be 100% in six months or 20% uh, in 20% uh, uh, in uh, uh, um, a quarter, right? Uh, depending on how much you have already achieved right so how much you have already achieved what is your growth run rate and how where are you uh, uh, projecting your your growth from right if you're asking for money to, to for doing some territory expansion you are expecting to replicate the kind of growth path that you have seen in your primary territories right so you expect similar kind of uh, market uh, 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 or, or sales volumes to kind of expand accordingly right but remember that with series funding, every time you are raising money uh, uh, as part of your series funds, you are essentially diluting your, the founders are diluting their stake uh, in the organization, right? So as the organization raises more and more money, uh, the promoter stakes will come down and uh, the company will become more and more uh, corporatized, right? With, with different kinds of investors coming into the uh, mix, right? Coming onto the board itself, right? Once you are corporatized, uh, you know, you have a pretty stable pipeline, right? You now have to look at 
uh, some other things, right? You have to look at now creating a structure within your uh, organization, right? Uh, because things have to be uh, um, executed properly, right? So you build functional teams around it. You look for process improvement now, more on the, the, the innovation part, right? You're, you're mandated with statutory uh, compliances that as an organization, you have to, uh, as a corporate organization, you have to kind of follow. And that also leads to your corporate social responsibilities, right? Now, in this process of starting out with a uh, uh, with some ideas as a founder, right, to the the organization, to the business becoming a corporate entity, what has happened is each of those uh, initial thought processes that the founders had in terms of setting the mission, right, setting the vision, executing the operation, each one of them have essentially become functional units within the organization itself. And because these organizational units are formed from, from uh, what the uh, how the founders started the organization, so a lot of the founders uh, uh, process, uh, uh, you know, their their process methodologies have essentially become the the culture of the organization as these teams are formed and they continue to uh, expand on those initial processes right so that's how each company kind of reflects the the sentiments the personalities the uh, thought processes of their founding team right uh, over time uh, the 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 corporate will mature and uh, you know you may want to get into more uh, 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 funding right and you get into probably even ipos right uh, launching the company for uh, uh, you know uh, uh, for for the general public to kind of participate in right you can go ahead and uh, offer stakes right uh, in order to meet your capital uh, your capital needs like additional expansion plans you're not looking for private investors but now you're going to the public for that right so it comes in with your statutory declarations with your uh, set of investors whether they're anchor investors your institutional investors or your retail investors try to discover what is your price band for uh, you know what is the market willing to pay uh, given your history uh, given your previous uh, revenue streams and all of that and eventually you will get listed in the primary market and your shares will start getting traded in the in the secondary market where there are a number of people hundreds and thousands of people who are who are your shareholders who would be scrutinizing? Uh, who would be scrutinizing the results, the, the performance of the company, right? So you move. Uh, you know, uh, the the board becomes responsible for uh, creating wealth for their uh, or creating value for their stakeholders, and that is where uh, stakeholders also play a. Uh, uh, a role in ensuring the corporate governance standards are maintained right so that's essentially the long journey from uh, thinking about creating a company to uh, probably getting a stage to a stage where you are uh, uh, creating a, created a business that is creating uh, value for all its shareholders right so that said i i think we are uh, close to the R, so I'll kind of end my talk there, right? And uh, probably take on uh, questions. Right, I'll stop my presentation so that uh, at least I can be visible. Yeah. Students, if you have any questions, please ask. I promised Professor Tej that I would finish within the hour. Uh, so I'm just trying to stick to that. Uh, Shoibal, would it be possible to send us a uh, send us a copy of the of the recording if you're making one? Uh, sure, sir. We'll do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Students, no questions. So I guess the presentation was too good. Like, uh, uh, yeah. So if there are no questions, then we would uh, wind up. So before we wind up, uh, definitely a big thanks to you. The way you uh, 
uh, presented showed the different stages of entrepreneurship, starting with founding team, vision, market gap, product idea, vision, company formation, pitch deck, MVP, test market. Like it was really very good. And uh, you explained each and every step with further details. I guess that uh, should be helpful for our students who want to pursue entrepreneurship in the future. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Tejbanta Singh sir for uh, giving us such a wonderful resource person for today's uh, session. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. The, the thing with entrepreneurship, as I said, it is it is a behavioral act and uh, it's something that, yes, I have tried to capture some of my experiences in, in those uh, slides, right? But uh, there are variants to that. There are things that you do in parallel. There are things that uh, uh, can be kind of optimized further. And that's where uh, uh, for every entrepreneur, it is important to be part of, uh, you know, to have a mentoring team who can show the pitfalls uh, 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 that lie ahead. Whether that mentoring team is coming through an incubation center, whether that is coming through a uh, uh, through a startup hub, or that is coming from from other people who have walked this journey, right? Uh, that is always very very important, right? And that's the difference between uh, uh, you know an idea staying an idea and those ideas which have become uh, unicorns today. Right? Remember, the product that you see has started out as somebody's idea. Very true, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for such a wonderful session. Uh, we wind up the meeting here. Thank you all. Thank you, students. Thank you, yes. sir. Uh, did you send out the participation forms? Yes. All right. We see. Yes, I have done that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, students. Thank have a good day. Yes, sir.